Well, greetings out there on YouTube land and welcome to today's blockbuster video featuring the repair and testing of the contents of this beautifully boxed parcel you see before you. So without further ado, let's cut open those seams and see what our assignment is for the day. I guess all my bitching and moaning about lousy boxing of amps uh, for shipment has led to uh, a complete renaissance of shipping techniques. Look at this. I even have like a pull string here, pull to open, and inside the uh, foam protective layers, we have another uh, layer of foam rubber, and at the bottom we see the amp chassis and no doubt the tubes right here. So let me finish unpacking and get this jewel up and on the workbench. Well lo and behold what we have before us here is about the cleanest, nicest I believe 1965 Showman amp that I have ever laid eyes on. These things aren't all that common but my god look at the the quality of the metal no corrosion, no discoloration, even around the output tubes. Okay, let's take a look at the control panel and also at the circuit. Well, I have to say, this one takes the cake, okay? It is not a dual showman, but a showman amp. We'll discuss the difference between this and the dual showman in a few minutes, but look at this blackface control panel absolutely stunning beautiful shape it has tremolo we see here speed and intensity and uh, two separate channels um, the normal channel and vibrato channel fairly typical for fender we know that what separates this from most other fender amps is the fact that it has four 6L6 GC output tubes okay look at this circuit completely original it appears to me there's our little uh, roach in the sleeping bag there uh, our little opto isolator unit for the tremolo every capacitor appears to be original every wire and it's immaculate good grief and it's my understanding the person who sent this used it heavily. Well, you know, we got a letter with this. So let's take a look at the letter and see uh, what the complaints are about the amp and what we're supposed to pay attention to when repairing it. Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, thanks so much for taking interest in my 65 Fender Showman 12. Okay, that nails it down. Uh, it's named after the uh, diameter of the speaker. Okay, haven't you uh, used it in a good decade or so and forgot I even had it? Well, then we'll just keep it and let that uh, forgetfulness uh, continue. No, I'm just kidding. Well, maybe. Anyway, the last time I used it, it failed me. In a jam session, I had to use my 1968 Fender Baseman. Boy, what a crime huh, to have to resort to such a wretched backup as a Fender Baseman. What a lucky guy. Um, he was using the tremolo channel. After a good 15 minutes or so, the volume is slowly decreasing by itself. Then it quit altogether. Uh, I wasn't even using tremolo at all. Okay, the amplifier just quit working. Since then, it's been in a climate control storage area in the basement uh, and forgotten about. Okay, and it sure looks like there was climate control storage involved because it is you could sell it for new uh, please give it a good tune-up replace whatever it needs alright so uh, that's about it uh, it just went dead okay during use it died in action and we're gonna try to re uh, resurrect it uh, I think this should be an interesting repair because dying in action uh, is something you hear about fairly often so you know, you think right away about just awful things. Oh my God, a power transformer might have failed. Um, you know, you never know what it can be that can shut one of these down completely. Um, it can be something rather superficial. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started on this and find out exactly what's wrong with it. 
let's tune it up and make it sound better than the day it was new okay if you're ready for that grab your uh, quart of muscatel and uh, pull up an easy chair and let's get going okay now that we're examining the uh, circuit up close let me first draw your attention to the coating that's put over the uh, solder joints here in the uh, six diode rectifier section and negative DC bias supply um, the factory puts this on there so that if they get one back on warranty they know it's been fussed with um, the rest of the connections do not seem to have that coating on them okay so um, I'm guessing this is the primary area that um, they were worried about people amateurs fooling around with the amps I guess and uh, this way they could disallow the warranty if needed so uh, let's go ahead uh, then with our close-up examination second observation of note and this is a very favorable one is all of the blue molded nonpolar caps are present we know that the yellow astrons have a notoriously high failure rate whereas the blue astrons do not it's almost rare to find a failed blue astron cap so uh, thank heavens they are blue astrons and that they are present the same cannot be said about these electrolytic uh, cathode bypass caps however they'll almost certainly have to be replaced as well as the uh, large electrolytic filter caps in the doghouse speaking of which let's flip this over and take a look at it. here's another uh, to me unique observation and that is I bet you the factory put this piece of masking tape over the bias adjustment pot so that uh, you know little Johnny couldn't come in the back and say you know what I'm just gonna play with this and turn it way up and fry the 6L6's uh, I've never seen that before okay but it makes really good sense and it looks just like the type of masking tape that Loopy used to sign okay back in the in the tweed uh, fem okay without further ado then let's uh, remove the doghouse cover and take a look at our original electrolytics well I had to actually use a pry bar to get the doghouse cover off of the electrolytics you see where that little piece of black weather stripping stuck to the surfaces also notice that these things have been puking their uh, entrails out here all over the place including in the lid itself so um, I'm thinking odds are these should probably be replaced huh yeah no kidding so um, they are they do appear to be completely original uh, we'll also have to check and probably replace these resistors with metal film okay but I'm gonna clean this mess up okay I don't like the sight of drizzly electrolyte all over a otherwise spotless amp chassis as I promised earlier let's take a look at the very few differences between a single and dual showman amp first off on the dual showman the output transformer is 125A29A whereas on the single showman it's 125A30A remember this is a single showman sure enough 125A30A as predicted another thing is that the uh, resistor to ground right here in the long tail pair is 47 ohms in the, in the single showman 100 ohms in the dual showman let's flip it over and take a look at that resistor and sure enough here is that resistor yellow violet black which is 47 ohms which is exactly what it should be for the single showman now uh, the reason I'm going through this is uh, some of you sometimes send me uh, comments and questions how can I identify my circuit well the best way is print out some of the schematics for what circuit it could be and go in and look at these small differences okay that that will help you nail down the accurate identification of the circuit in your amp now in this case um, 
you have to use subtle differences like that to identify the circuit, but if you have the entire amp, it's fairly obvious uh, that the single showman has one 12 inch speaker, the dual showman has two 12 inch speakers. Okay, and in this schematic, they show the second 12 inch speaker with dotted lines and kind of a lighter outline. So it can be a single showman or a dual showman. Okay, they're letting one uh, schematic cover both circuits. Now those of you who are wondering how four 6L6 GCs can gang up on a single 12 inch speaker and not just tear it to shreds, uh, I think that's a good question to ask. I'm not exactly sure what speaker comes in the single showman, but it must be a fire breathing monster to be able to put up with this type of output power. I'll check into it and we'll figure that out before the end of the video. Now generally I kind of resolve certain basic uh, issues in the amp before I ever plug it in to test it. And the first is going to be that you see we have a three wire power cord that's been installed. I'm going to go through, I know darn well that I don't agree with them leaving that polarity switch in place and that I normally use that polarity switch to make a switchable NFB loop. So uh, I'm going to remove all the wires here uh, to the fuse and to the on off switch and the polarity switch and rewire that correctly so that I know that when I do flip the switch on uh, that nothing is being energized that shouldn't be like the chassis okay um, so uh, let me now uh, go ahead and start on that and rewire the primary circuit uh, to what I think is the proper uh, configuration and in preparation for that rewiring I removed the fuse and it is a slow blow two and a half amp fuse and looking at the schematic we see that that is exactly what is recommended for the circuit we also see that it's not blown so whatever failed in this amp okay it wasn't the fuse uh, let's face it it hardly is ever that easy uh, something died a slow and terrible death in here um, let's keep our fingers crossed it isn't that okay so um, We've got the fuse out. I'm going to go ahead now and do my rewiring and I will discuss it with you in just a sec. Also as I'm dealing with the uh, polarity switch and the on off switch, uh, notice that they still have those rubber insulating covers over the toggles. Now the only reason I can think of they do that is uh, really uh, you don't touch metal very often when you're fooling around with an amp. Okay, you touching plastic knobs on the front, plastic switches, and back here you could be touching a metal toggle switch, but they put the insulation on there for you, okay, so that it would protect you if the chassis did have potential. The one thing they didn't think of, though, is that if you have a shielded uh, input uh, from a uh, cable from a guitar plugged in, the guitar strings and all the metal parts of the guitar are charged just the same as the metal chassis because the shielding carries uh, the charge from the chassis right up to all the metal parts in the uh, guitar. So uh, yes, you've got your lovely little protection here and ooh, you can just stand in that bathtub and flip your switches all you want, but God help you if you touch the guitar strings while it's plugged in. Okay, so it's kind of a superficial um, safety measure, um, kind of woefully inadequate, but rarely seen which tells me this amp has seen very little use because one of the first things to go are these will just wear out from continuous use and it's almost unheard of to ever find them in place okay so check it out if you're restoring one of these you should have these on the toggle switch arms now since I have disconnected the power transformer primary from the circuit I can check to see if there is continuity in the primary winding. Okay, if 
the transformer has failed and the primary wind, winding is burned in an open condition, uh, this test will detect that. And thank heavens we can uh, breathe again. We see that there is continuity so the primary winding of the power transformer is still in good shape. Next we'll have to check the uh, 6.3 volt output and the high voltage output of the transformer to make sure that those windings are intact. Uh, if they are then we can pretty well rule out the power transformer as the uh, problem with the amp that shut it down completely. Okay here is our first possibility for what may have shut the amp down and that is that the wire that connects the return from the AC supply to the primary winding of the power transformer literally just fell off of its connection when I touched it. Okay, it, it would be incredible if that's all that was wrong with this. That and this would shut it down and it could do it gradually too if the connection was gradually weakened by vibration to where it finally could not conduct sufficient AC to uh, power our power transformer. Okay, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. If everything else checks out after I put it together, that may have been the problem. Let's take a few seconds out here uh, for an unofficial sponsor, and that is uh, the Circle K Polar Pop 44 ounces of caffeinated delight. Okay, it's what keeps me going out here in the sweltering workshop. Now granted the uh, sudden infusion of 44 ounces of liquid into your colon is much the same as a retrograde enema with probably about the same result so you'd best have a bathroom nearby but I swear by them, uh, also swear at them every once in a while but do yourself a favor okay drop into your Circle K and help yourself to a tasty delicious and very stimulating polar pop. Okay, the primary circuit has been rewired. Uh, let me show you how I did it uh, with the diagram here. We have the black and the white wires coming in from the AC plug. And we have that um, accessory outlet back here. It's a socket uh, in which you can plug other electrical devices into the rear of the amp we'll go straight there and use it sort of like a terminal strip then we'll take our black wire here I go to one side of the on off toggle from the other side of the toggle I go to the tail of the uh, fuse holder and then from the upper uh, little uh, bracket there from the fuse holder I run that down to the primary of the power transformer the other wire from the uh, power transformer primary goes up here directly to the white or return AC wire and you see here is the white going here and here is the primary winding for the transformer the black goes here comes over to the toggle switch through the toggle to the tail of the fuse holder and then back to the other primary wire. Now conventional wisdom says you're supposed to go to the fuse holder first and then to the on off switch and then to the primary. I, now the justification for that is that if the on off switch just spontaneously one day decides to short out I guess to the chassis uh, then the fuse will protect you and I say in all my life and several other afterlives I have never in my life heard of a plastic bodied toggle switch forming a dead short. Uh, also if you wire it that way and go to the fuse holder first then you can come over here and say I'm going to check the fuse in the amp. Flip the toggle off feeling very safe and unscrew the cap, grab all the fuse and get uh, a one heck of a shock and if you're touching the chassis with the other hand which is grounded by the uh, third green ground wire 
uh, you could be killed. Okay, so let's just play the odds here. What are the odds of the on-off switch spontaneously going to a dead short versus the odds of somebody turning the amp off and checking the fuse and getting electrocuted? To me, this is by far the safest way to wire the primary circuit. Now let's continue our scrutiny of the circuit components. Um, these are the things you usually miss the first time you look it over. Look here at our screen resistors. Okay, 470 ohms. 470. They're nice and bright. Everything looks good, but look at this one. Not only is it all burned up, it's cracked in half. Okay, so obviously something went on here. Uh, maybe there was a short in the screen that drew so much current you'd think it would have blown the fuse but obviously this screen resistor has been to hell and never came back okay whereas the others look like you could pack them up and sell them for new okay so let's change out these 470 ohm screen resistors and also the 1500 ohm grid blockers that are underneath them for those of you who like to relate the circuit to the schematic uh, here are our four output tubes, our 6L6s. You see that we have our 1 watt 470 ohm screen resistor going into each screen. So we're going to replace these. And we have the 1500 ohm grid blocker resistor here, 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 and here. Now these are generally damaged by heat because they were rather foolishly placed right against the socket of a 6L6 and the socket is above the tube where the heat will rise and just roast the socket and the contents. So um, almost always on these you'll find that you need to replace the grid blockers or grid stoppers and the screen resistors. Let's do that. There are the four uh, 470 ohm screen resistors. Uh, let's go ahead and check uh, and see uh, if they had maintained their value. Since these are carbon comp resistors, you know they haven't. But let's go ahead and uh, check one and see. And here we go. We see that it's, what, about uh, 40 ohms high, which is uh, or close to 10%. Uh, above the value it should be. It wouldn't be the end of the world. We probably could have left three of these in. Uh, I'm thinking that one that, that's broken in half there uh, probably needed to be replaced, but uh, I think we're better off replacing them. And also I'm going to use metal film resistors uh, just so that we don't have to worry about this again anytime in the foreseeable future. Here's our first 6L6 finished with the 1500 ohm uh, grid blocker right here in place and the 470 ohm screen resistor off to the side to avoid the heat. I also noticed that somebody's come in here and replaced some original wires with some god-awful looking zip uh, wire. Um, I, you know, someday somebody will look in here and blame me for this so I'm going to replace those two wires just for general principles so we have some appropriate looking wire in here in the circuit. Now we've replaced the four uh, 1500 ohm grid blockers and 470 ohm screen resistors uh, that were carbon comp. Now they are beautiful metal film resistors. I put the uh, screen, the 470 screen resistor, out kind of away from harm's way uh, to avoid the roasting heat from the output tubes. However, uh, the beauty of metal film resistors is that they can resist a lot of heat and maintain very, very close tolerances. They really don't vary much. And then I replace that hideous extension cord wire with some nice, kind of unobtrusive, sleek black wires that are nestled back there out of sight. So nobody will look in uh, in the future and say, wait a minute, look at that crappy wire. What fool worked on this amp? And they say, well, you know, I think Uncle Doug did this one. Say, oh man, he must have been guzzling the booze while he was working on this. And it may be true, but at least now it's not quite so obvious. 
And while I was at it, I also removed all that electrolyte leakage uh, from the electrolytic capacitors. Uh, so now the inside of the doghouse is almost as nice as the outside. Now that our output tubes are taken care of, let's turn our attention to the cathode bypass caps. Uh, we've got uh, two 25s, two 25s, and a single 25, all at 25 volts. Now the normal way to replace these is with 25 microfarad at 50 volt caps, just to play it safe. Now these are the positive ends. There's two caps in each of these large containers. And uh, what we do then is heat up the eyelet and pull out the two positive ends of each of these large caps and the single positive end of this one. Now you really can't pull the negative end out because it continues on through and is used to ground the capacitors. So uh, you're going to have to just clip the negative end but you can unsolder the positive ends and there's a total of five. So we have our five uh, 25 microfarad at 50 volt caps ready to be installed. All right, here's our first pair of cathode bypass caps uh, soldered in place. The positive ends are uh, one in each of the two eyelets. You know the positive end uh, in most of these caps. There'll be a dent here at the positive end. Also, you'll see that it'll have a minus pointing at the negative end. The negative leads, I twist and then insert them uh, as like a single twisted lead into the eyelet down here. After I've soldered it into the eyelet, I go ahead and I solder the two leads together a bit up here just to really stabilize them and get good contact with ground. And while you have those uh, bypass caps out, it's a nice time to uh, check uh, each of the bias resistors to make sure that it's not out of spec. Uh, three of them checked out, but uh, this one right here did not. It's supposed to be uh, 1500 ohms, and you see that it is close to 2000, which is about a 33% error. So I'm going to replace uh, this one uh, right here, okay, that, that goes uh, from this islet to this islet. The others have checked out okay. I'll do the same up here with this one. Why, you may ask, is the value of these bias resistors so important? Uh, because they establish the bias for each of your preamp tubes. And if the value is way too high, like it was in the case of this one that's been removed, uh, this tube will be operating below its uh, a proper bias level and it can have an adverse effect on tone and gain. Okay, so we want to make sure, above all, that our preamp bias resistors are all well within the spec. And what is spec, you ask? Well, you just read what it says. In this case, it's 8, 2 times 10. This one's 820. That's what it uh, measured out at. And this one is red, violet, red. So that's 2,700. 100, 2700 ohms and it checks out correctly. You can also look down here on your schematic and see to make sure that the value that you're reading on the uh, resistor is correct. Well all the bypass caps have been replaced. The resistors have all been tested and replaced as needed. Um, we've also replaced the filter cap for the negative DC bias supply. Uh, remember when you're putting it in, it's the only electrolytic that goes positive to ground in the whole circuit. Okay, so be very careful. Uh, you're used to doing negative to ground, but for this uh, bias supply uh, filter, it is positive to ground. Also, be sure you go to at least 50 volts. This I put in a 50 microfarad at 50 volt. That seems to work really well in this position. Don't go with the 25 volts because uh, the circuit operates generally at a higher voltage than that. So um, it's just kind of silly. Okay, so 50 at 50 works great. Now let's flip this uh, chassis over and replace those leaky, nasty uh, electrolytic filter cap. Well, I unsoldered the uh, positive ends of the three. Uh, large uh, electrolytic filter caps. 
they are uh, 20 microfarads at 525 volts. Look at the condition of these things. The electrolyte le is leaking. Look at this. Talk about hemorrhoids, huh? Look at those lumps. These are just wretched, okay? And these are even worse. These are the two um, caps that are put into series to give you that really high surge of voltage resistance. We'll look at the schematic in just a second and see what's special about those. But for now, I think it's time to completely remove these. I also removed the uh, two internodal resistors uh, because uh, they're almost always uh, out of spec and let's replace them with some good um, metal film resistors, okay? Now those wretched Astrons have been removed. Uh, this will be the capacitor that I'm going to uh, install in their place. It's a uh, F&T 22 microfarad at 500 volts. Slightly lower than the voltage rating on uh, the old capacitors, but I have been using these things uh, in all restorations like this and have never had any issues whatsoever. One problem has arisen though in the value of the internodal resistors. Uh, this one right here is 10K and this one is 10K. If we look here at the schematic it says it should be 1K and 4700 ohms. Okay, Completely different than what's in it. I've also looked back over all the other schematics uh, for the uh, Showman amp and uh, the only other option I can see is that it was 10k and 2.2k here but at no place on any of those schematics do I find 10k and 10k so uh, that's sort of an enigma and um, so what I think I'm going to do is follow the old adage uh, when in doubt uh, believe the schematic and instead of the 10K that uh, was in place, I'm going to install a 1K resistor here and a 4,700 ohm resistor here. Okay, and then we know what the voltages are supposed to be uh, in the amplifier. Check those voltages and see if we have 440 volts after the 1K, 400 volts, after the uh, 4700 ohm resistor if these values are too high or too low then we'll go back and tailor the resistors to achieve schematic level voltages so here are our replacement uh, resistors uh, they are the metal film uh, this one is brown black red which is 1000 ohms this one is yellow violet red which is 4700 ohms well our three new 22 at 500 volt F&T's have been installed and those uh, back to original spec resistors have uh, been put in uh, 1k and 4.7k now let's take a look at the reservoir caps right here now let's take a look over here at the schematic we see that originally there was a 70 microfarad at 350 volt in series with another 70 at 350. Now when you put two uh, electrolytic caps in series like this you end up with half of the capacitance of one of the two and you add the two voltages together. So originally this would have been 35 microfarads at 700 volts and that's what's in it but as we've seen these original caps are in just hideous condition let's remove them when I'm making videos like this I always try to point out uh, pitfalls for those who are kinda just getting started out on amplifier repair and boy this is a, a real classic one here okay we've been wiring our electrolytics so that this down here is the uh, power rail as we call it and it's always the plus end of the electrolytic and back here is ground and so we have negative 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 but with these two we don't want to follow in that pattern because these are in series so we start off here with the positive end look up here 
at our schematic and there's the positive end looking right here at the power rail, the B plus rail and we'll run up here to the negative end the negative end however is not grounded it connects beneath the eyelet board over here to this end of the second of the two capacitors in series comes down here and then that eyelet right there will be ground okay so it's in here around and down here to ground so you have to be sure that your capacitors then are in a, a sort of head to tail orientation to achieve your uh, series configuration now there's one other thing that I noticed here that made me shiver with terror and that is I'm gonna try to close close in right here and look this red wire does not go here to ground it goes past the ground and goes down through a hole in the eyelet board but look right here there is a bare spot in that wire that is making contact with ground so to me there is a dead short here in the worst possible place so what I'm gonna have to do is remove this wire and replace it with one that has proper insulation to avoid that dead short perhaps that's what caused the amplifier to fail who knows uh, we've already found one other really good reason uh, for failure so uh, but as we're doing our work we eliminate any sort of mistakes shorts cold solder joints anything that we can detect while we're doing our work so we've got two things to do here first install our reservoir caps in series secondly get rid of this dead short right here here's an even better view of it and as you can see I clipped this wire and the capacitor itself was making contact with that wire not correct so let's take a look up here at the schematic and here's what's happened we're coming here we're going in to the first of the two reservoir caps in series and the wire right here is connected to ground we're going straight to ground with the B plus bypassing the reservoir caps okay B plus coming in right here and instead of going to this capacitor through and out it was coming right over here and going dead right to ground now I don't know how the amp could ever work like that in the first place perhaps a ground didn't um, make contact with the wire uh, until a little later but it looks like maybe when this one was being soldered in place they burned right through the insulation of the B plus wire okay that's just, just a disaster here so uh, let's fix this up and then let's install our replacement caps now now let's take a look over here at the replacement reservoir caps and there are 100 microfarad at 350 so when we put them in series we'll get 100 uh, 100 which will give us 50 microfarads which is 15 higher than original remember it was originally 35 now we have 50 microfarads and 350 plus 350 we have our 700 volts of surge protection okay so uh, not only then will I install the new reservoir caps in series but I'm also going to correct that dead short wire also while you have those reservoir caps removed from the circuit take advantage of their absence to measure the values of the two reservoir resistors these are 220 K they're the strapping resistors here that uh, run in parallel with each of those uh, reservoir capacitors um, I've been told that they help to equally distribute the voltage between the two caps so that you don't have 500 volts uh, hitting one and 50 volts hitting the other okay I've also heard tell that these uh, help to drain the uh, the B plus storage in the electrolytics when you turn off the amp so this will uh, quickly eliminate the B plus charge in the uh, caps and it also uh, from my understanding is equally distributes the peak voltage between the two series reservoir capacitors
Here you see on the schematic the two resistors in series, sort of like a built-in uh, capacitor discharging tool shut off the uh, power uh, to the power supply and the electrolytics then can drain through 440k ohms of uh, resistance to ground. Then to prevent the reoccurrence of this short circuit situation I closed the gap in the insulation of the red wire pushed it back as far as I could away from the eyelet here that's grounded and then I put an L-shaped piece of ins rubber impregnated insulating board between that wire and the grounded eyelet. So I think we're uh, safe and secure here that that uh, grounding situation will, will not reoccur. Alright, now that all the electrolytics uh, and power resistors have been replaced, let's go ahead and uh, secure the cover back on the doghouse. Uh, sometimes it's tempting to leave that cover off so you can test voltages and things like that, but with this thing, uh, uh, with the chassis upside down, uh, there is a chance you might run your hand or arm or something underneath there and come in contact with a B plus and get the heck shocked out of you. So I think until we uh, or if we ever need to open this again, we'd better put the cap on it just to protect ourselves. All right, now I've flipped the chassis over here. Uh, let's just briefly review what all has been done. The uh, screen and a grid a blocker resistors have been replaced all of the cathode bypass caps and out of spec bias resistors that have been replaced the negative DC power supply cap has been replaced we've done all the electrolytic capacitors uh, in the doghouse and let's also remember three things number one we found a broken primary wire okay we also found a, a burned up and broken in half a screen resistor and in the power supply we found a dead short okay so we've not only installed new parts but we've resolved three very serious issues now I think it's time to put in some tubes plug this in and see what happens well I plugged in the four uh, preamp and uh, phase inverter tubes uh, it's kinda nice there's a stick on tape on the socket that uh, facilitates the identification of the proper tube to go in the socket. I think that's a real nice touch. Now it's time to install the uh, four 6L6GC. Now recall that the screen resistor uh, on this far right 6L6 was completely burnt up and it actually split in half. Uh, there may be a short in the screen in that tube and it's probably not wise to just go plug it back in and hope for the best. Okay, and also since the tubes were not numbered, I have no way of knowing which one of the four 6L6s went into that socket. So let's take a look at the tube and see if there's anything we can do to make sure that we're not plugging in a tube with a dead short. Now I and a lot of people have tube testers. We could plug in the 6L6s and uh, test for shorts, but probably an equal number or more of you don't have a tube tester. So let me show you a manual way that you can test uh, your four 6L6s or whatever tube your uh, output tube you're using to uh, detect uh, an, an internal screen short. Okay, let's look at the tube diagram. We see that the screen is going to be connected to pin 4. Now where could the short occur? Well, the screen could be touching the suppressor grid and cathode okay that's connected to pin 8 or it could be touching the signal grid which is connected to pin 5 so what I'm going to do is hook up my ohmmeter to pin 4 of each of the tubes and see if there's any continuity to pin 5 or pin 8 alright I have uh, an alligator clip on pin 4 which is the screen grid uh, I also have the ohmmeter there for you to see. So let's go to pin 5, 6, 7, pin 8. As you can see, there's no continuity whatsoever in this tube. Now I'm going to repeat that process with each of the other three. Here's the second tube. We'll go pin 5. 
six, seven, eight. No continuity. Third 606, pin 5, pin 8, nothing. Here's our last chance to find a uh, hidden short circuit, 5, 8. Okay, it appears that this tube set is just fine, and whatever the problem was, it must have arisen in a previous tube set to harm that screen resistor. But this set uh, gets a clear bill of health uh, as far as internal shorts, so let's go ahead and install them. Now looking at the schematic, you can see that when you have four output tubes, uh, there are two pairs of tubes, and each of the pairs are in parallel. These are parallel, and this pair is in parallel. So I'm going to install my Eurotubes probe under tube number one, and under tube number three so I can see what's going on in each of the two tube pairs and as you can see that's been done back here one and three alright let's uh, switch this beast on we're plugged into the current limiter to prevent any sort of damage due to short circuits uh, and uh, I think we're ready to uh, see how the amp behaves if you recall, I was speculating about what type of speaker it would uh, be that could withstand the fire-breathing output of four 606 GCs, and we see that uh, they're suggesting that it be rated at at least 85 watts. Okay, uh, my I don't have an 85 watt speaker here, so uh, we'll just use the shop speaker, which is probably like you know 30 or 35 watts, and just keep the uh, volume turned down. All right, I'm injecting a 500 cycle per second tone. Um, and uh, let's go ahead then and flip the on switch. Bear in mind that it is in standby. We see that the pilot light works. That's always a good sign. And we are getting some response. Uh, of course, our Eurotube probes uh, have, will only measure the B+. Plus, so uh, that's not uh, occurring yet in the circuit because uh, we're in standby mode. Okay, let's take it off standby, and we see that we are getting amplification. But I don't like what I'm seeing here. Look at that imbalance and look at the plate current. Let's turn this off. Okay, let's talk about what we just saw. Uh, tremendous plate current up here from this tube uh, much lower very very low plate current in this tube uh, it's almost as if our negative DC bias voltage is not getting to the grid of this tube up here and maybe to this pair of tubes okay so let's uh, pull the tubes out and monitor what the negative DC bias voltage is that's being applied to the grids of each of the four 6L6s. It should be absolutely identical. Okay, but what if it's not? What if it's zero here and maximum here? Uh, you're, you would probably see exactly what we just saw. So let's do that. I'm going to pull the tubes out to avoid any damage and uh, then go ahead and measure what the negative DC bias voltage is on each of the grids. Okay, I, all of the 6L6s have been removed from their sockets. Uh, I've plugged the amp back in and I am hooked on to pin number 5 which is the uh, signal grid pin. Let's see what type of negative DC bias supply voltage where is being applied to this grid. Well in the first one that had the sky high plate current it's negative 41 volts. Okay let's move on down the line. We'll go over here and clip onto this one. Negative 41 volts. Let's go over here and clip on well, a little different, negative 43.9 volts. Okay, and for the final, the fourth and final tube, negative 42.9. So, 
we do have, although there is a slightly different uh, amount of bias voltage being delivered to this pair, a little higher uh, amount than to the first two, but we have our bias voltage being delivered. Okay, it makes you wonder how the heck then or why is is this particular tube going nuts? Okay, let's just for the heck of it, let's check the plate current in the even number tubes, number two and number four. All right, as you can see, the uh, Eurotubes probes are under uh, tube number two and four. Now, okay, the other uh, pair members from the first two that we measured. Uh, let's go ahead and take this jewel off standby and see what type of plate current we have. Good grief. Okay, this is insane. Let's go off of standby and uh, off in power. Okay, this is outrageously high. Now, we're not reading the plate current for two tubes. That was for the single tube that that one's under, and it's insane. This pair over here is going berserk, and this pair over here is... Uh, just loping along uh, at about 1 RPM, okay? So uh, there's something really fishy going on here. It makes me wonder about the output transformer, okay, which is not a pleasant thought. Uh, let's measure the resistance of the two uh, windings, of the secondary windings in the output transformer. Now from pin 3, which is the plate of the uh, left-hand pair, down to the B plus down here. So in other words, the center tap to pin three of this pair is only 23.1 ohms. Now let's measure what the resistance is of the lower half winding. All right, same conditions. Pin three to the center tap, 36.3 ohms. So, the first pair, uh, 23.1 ohms for that half winding. Bottom pair is 36.3 ohms. Now, first of all, these seem very low to me, the values overall. And the bottom one is over 50% greater than the upper one. And that you never see that. You'll see a few ohm, ohms difference, but not 50%. Okay, one... All right, I've numbered the tubes to keep them straight. Um, and uh, what I've done is put the three and four, the really cold tubes, in the hot sockets and the previously very hot tubes in the cold sockets. Let's see if the plate current follows the tubes or if it follows the socket. I'm waiting for the uh, tubes to warm up, but remember before this was over a hundred milliamps and this was what, about 20 or 30? Let's see if that situation reverses, it's the tubes. Okay, let's take it off standby. Hmm, not what I expected. The right hand sockets still aren't putting out though, are they? Remember, that's the tube that was over 100. This now is putting out uh, a good amount of uh, plate current. I don't know. Not only did it stay where this, so this pair of sockets is hotter, but it, it came down considerably to a normal level. This, however, is still way too low. When we get this plate current thing straightened out and it's time to bias the amp accurately, I can't plug into the current limiter on a big uh, current drawing amp like this. I've got to go into the wall socket to uh, set the bias. Well gang, I think the writing's on the wall with this one and it's a sad sight. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the output transformer is to blame. Okay, uh, let's look at the evidence. Uh, one of the half windings is more than 50 percent different from the other in DC resistance. Now I know that impedance is really what matters with a transformer, but you cannot just ignore the fact that the DC resistance and essentially the length of winding 
uh, of one of the half windings is over 50% greater than the other. Secondly, no matter what, this pair of tubes is always hotter than this pair of tubes, even if you switch the tubes, okay? And if the high uh, plate current uh, always uh, resides over here, at, which is serviced by one of the half windings, and this one is serviced by the other, uh, there's no doubt then that the performance, the output of the half windings is significantly different. There is no way to bias these four output tubes. And finally, just to be sure, I checked every soldered connection, every component, the tube sockets, every wire, uh, everything that I could to, to see if I couldn't find some other culprit, and there was none. The final bit of evidence was that uh, while I was doing some more testing, uh, and these two tubes here were like 20 milliamps, the number two tube which is this one here and in our earlier test actually showed the highest plate current actually just burst like a like a flash bulb and developed just internal shorts between every single component okay you can see from the outside this is a blown tube now that pretty well ruined my uh, match set of four tubes also I wonder if this was the tube that caused the failed screen resistor over here. You know, we'll never know that for sure. But anyway, uh, I'm going to have to go in and tell the owner of the amp some very sad news. Number one, I would like to order a replacement output transformer. Number two, I need to order another match set of four output tubes. Okay, so I know uh, this isn't going to make his day, but it's going to have to be done. If we're going to get this amp to operate just at its optimum, that's what we've got to do. Okay, so I'm going to go talk to him. I'll be back in just a few minutes and we'll uh, figure out what we've got to do. Well, I'm back and i got to say that the owner took it a lot better than I would have. In fact, he really seemed unfazed. He said, go ahead, uh, do what you think is right, get the best output transformer you can find. And he likes the Tungsol uh, output tubes. And you know, I was looking these are from 2007 that's 14 years old it's probably long overdue for a, a set of new output tubes so it wasn't he wasn't really too broken up about that either so I'm gonna go order a match set of four of the Tungsol 6L6 GC's and I'm gonna hunt down a suitable output transformer for this amplifier okay the replacement transformer has been ordered I found a Hammond uh, that had a 100 watt uh, power output and it had 2000 ohms primary impedance and 4, 8 and 16 ohms secondary impedance so it, it will give us the flexibility to not only uh, fix up this uh, particular circuit but it also can be used with various uh, different speaker cabinets and uh, single speakers now while we're waiting for it to be delivered, uh, let's talk briefly about the Showman amp. Okay, it was the first piggyback amp that Fender ever offered. It was introduced in 1960. It started out with that kind of rough blonde Tolex, then it went to a smooth blonde, and then finally to the black uh, Tolex that uh, is uh, associated with this particular model that we have here. Uh, the serial number on this one is A03417, which by my calculations would be around July of 1965. The Showman was developed by Fender because uh, some of these musical venues were getting rather large, okay? You would have uh, very large ballrooms and the uh, musicians were asking for more powerful amplifiers uh, so they could play these larger venues and the Showman uh, and the Twin of course were the two amps that um, Fender developed in response to this need. Now the Twin was rated at this time at about 80 watts. Okay so uh, for the Showman they took the uh, preamp and the tremolo of the Vibrasonic amp and combined it with the output stages of the twin. 
a lot of us have heard tales of how Dick Dale was uh, involved in the development of this amp that he kept telling Fender, I need a more powerful amp, and he was just blowing them up right and left. In fact, I think he boasted that he destroyed like 50 Fender amps before they finally came up with the showman that could withstand his withering uh, playing, mostly withering volume. Since this was the first piggyback amp, uh, Fender then started working on large uh, sealed back tone cabinets. Okay, they started out uh, one of them with a 15 inch JBL speaker with the tone ring. Now you may have heard about the tone ring. It, what it did is it suspended the speaker away from the baffle and let the air vent around the speaker, if you can imagine that. Those amps are worth a absolute fortune. Okay, um, also they uh, had uh, very large cabinets with two 15-inch JBLs, and they call that the Dual Showman. This particular amp uh, came with a JBL D120 12-inch uh, speaker. Okay, so uh, now I mentioned earlier that I thought it might be a Jensen. Well, the Jensen's didn't work too well uh, because the a Jensen P15N speaker was all they had available uh, at the time, and it was rated at between 30 and 50 watts. And I have a sneaky suspicion that that's the one that Dick Dale was blowing up right and left because the output of the amp is uh, about double the wattage toleration of the speaker, okay, which is just asking for trouble. So the Showman uh, amp ended up being the absolute top of the line for Fender for quite a while. And it came in various different iterations. You could get the one 12-inch uh, JBL speaker like this one. You could get two 12-inch JBLs, or you could get uh, one 15-inch or two 15-inch JBLs. One can only shiver in terror at the thought of what it must have been like to be in the front row of a Dick Dale concert when he showed up with the uh, Showman amp and the two 15-inch JBLs in the speaker cabinet. Uh, I'm thinking that there's a whole bunch of hearing aids that have been sold ever since. Well, it looks like uh, we've completed our historical review just in time for the delivery of our replacement output transformer. Uh, I got this from Amplified Parts in Tempe, Arizona. It's uh, very tempting to associate them with uh, CE distributors and uh, antique electronic parts since they all come from exactly the same place. Okay, so uh, let's get the box opened and uh, take a look at our new replacement output transformer. Well, we can see that it's very nicely double boxed with a ban the blade warning right there. Okay, so let's get this jewel open and see what it looks like. Well, we've got the boxes open, got the styrofoam packing uh, split apart, and here it is, our Hammond 1760W output transformer. Uh, as you can see, it has the appropriate primary impedance uh, for the four 6L6s of 2000 ohms. It is center tapped and the output uh, is appropriate for 4, 8, and 16 ohms. So there's three separate windings then for our secondary. Okay, so this should do quite nicely. This is a beast too. It's probably, I'm going to say close to 5 pounds. Okay, so um, I think it's going to be up to the job. And it is rated at 100 watts. Remember our output from our amp at maximum is 85 watts. So this is cutting it pretty close, but I think it should do. Now the question on my mind, and I'm sure yours too, is what are the half-winding resistances on this new uh, output transformer? So I've connected my ohmmeter to the center tap, which is the B plus input, and this will be one of the plate outputs. And wow, look how low, 14.4 ohms. Recall that the original transformer uh, had half windings at 22 ohms and 36.1 ohms, which meant that this one was 64% larger than this one. Let's see what the 
um, DC resistance is on the other winding and then calculate the percentage difference. And it appears to be 13.5 ohms. Uh, let's write down those two resistances and calculate the percentage. Well, uh, we see that the difference uh, is that the, the higher one here is only 6.6 percent greater than the smaller one, which is one-tenth the variance that we saw with the original transformer. It would appear then that we can get a lot better match between our four output tubes using this new replacement output transformer. Now it's time to remove the original output transformer from the chassis. There's only three wires on the primary side. This one right here is the center tap that carries the B-plus to the plates. These are the two wires that carry the B-plus to the plates. So I'll have to un unsolder one, two, three um, uh, connections here. And then on the secondary, it's real easy. There's a black wire that goes to ground and a green wire that goes to the speaker output jack. Okay, here's the original output transformer. And amazingly enough, the dimensions are absolutely identical to the replacement, even the uh, mounting holes in the feet, everything lines up perfectly. They're about the same weight, everything's the same. I, I'm really astounded. Uh, I double checked once it was out and the uh, two half windings still have a tremendous difference. Uh, so now it's time to install the new uh, output transformer and uh, then proceed with the biasing. And we must celebrate the very timely arrival of our mat set of four Tungsol 6L6 GCs. And I got them uh, from a store named Viva Tubes on eBay. Uh, you see here that we can email uh, either Rick or Austin at Viva Tubes or call them at that number. Now why I got them on eBay rather than going to my normal sources is that Tungsol tubes are very hard to get right now. Apparently due to COVID or shipping or God knows what, um, they're difficult to get. So um, I had to uh, hunt them down on eBay and these fellows provided excellent service, quick delivery, and uh, the price was a little higher than I can normally buy them for, but hey, if you can't buy them anywhere else, then this is as cheap as it gets. Okay, so I'm offering this to you as an alternative for some of the hard-to-get uh, remade tubes. Okay, these guys might be able to help you out. It's time to test our new output transformer. Uh, I've installed the tubes in the back, I, and for reasons that I do not understand. My Eurotubes probes have been acting up and giving me just off-the-wall readings and then when you go back and double check it's a different reading so I don't know if they're damaged or, or what's going on here but I'm not going to use them. I'm going to use the voltage drop across the uh, two half windings of the output transformer to calculate the uh, plate current and plate dissipation of the pairs of tubes. I know this makes it impossible to compare directly to the first measurement with the old output transformer, but really what matters here is that this pair is matched to this pair because these two act in tandem and they push, the, this pair pulls, this pair pushes, this pair pulls. So what we're concerned about is a balance between these two tubes and these two tubes each acting as a pair. Let's start off by measuring the DC resistance of the red to blue half winding and we see that it is 14.9 oh, ohms. I'll write that down and then we'll switch our probes and measure uh, the DC resistance for the red to brown lead. Okay, for a red to brown lead, it looks like 13.8 ohms. Okay, I've written down the values and 14.9 ohms for the red to blue half winding, 13.8 ohms for the red to brown. Now my calculations to get about 80 milliamps, remember this is for the pair of tubes that would be 40 milliamps each. 
uh, my calculations say that the voltage drop should be around 1.2 volts. So let's adjust our potentiometer until we get that value for the red to blue uh, pair of tubes. Also note that I am plugged into the wall AC, uh, not through the current limiter, so I can get a more accurate representation of the tube uh, plate current and bias. Now I've already tested it with the current limiter and I know there are no internal shorts so uh, the circuit has proven to be safe so now I'm going to use the wall AC uh, outlet to set the bias. Okay we see that it's a little low right now so let's run it up using our potentiometer let's reduce the negative DC bias resistance on the grid and increase our plate current. I'm going to get as close as I can to 1.2. 1, 1 okay, there we are. I'm going to write that number down. Okay, I've written it down. Now let's see what the voltage drop is across the red-brown winding. And we see that it is 1.11 negative DC volts. And by changing my probe position between the plate and ground, we'll see that our plate voltage, since the cathodes are grounded, we can measure it to ground, is 445 volts. Okay, here's the math. Um, the pair uh, was drawing 80.5 milliamps of current, which uh, figures out to about 40.25 each. Uh, which is a plate dissipation of 17.9 watts. Now, 18 watts is about 60%, so I think this is a pretty good level. It's a, a wee bit conservative, but it should give really good tone and tube longevity. Let's look at the other pair of tubes. Look at that, 80.43 milliamps within, what, seven one hundreds. Uh, for the individual uh, tubes, it's 40.22 uh, milliamps each. For a identical 17.9 watts of plate dissipation. So you cannot ask for better matched pairs than this. And this becomes even more impressive when you compare it to the performance of the original output transformer, in which the left hand pair was probably up around 250 milliamps for the two tubes versus maybe 50 milliamps for the right hand pair. I think that this outcome fully justifies the replacement of that original output transformer. Also, I should mention that I rewired the polarity switch so that it now offers a switchable on and off negative feedback loop. I've shown how to do this in previous videos, so I'm not going to go through the, all the steps here, but it's a very simple procedure. Also, I'm going to wire a 4 ohm speaker outlet uh, from the uh, or to the um, auxiliary speaker uh, jack right there uh, so that the owner can have uh, both 4 and 8 ohm outputs from the new output transformer. He okay, white was 4 ohms and it's connected here to the auxiliary output jack. Green was 8 ohms. That's to the regular cabinet speaker jack and the 16 ohm output is coiled up, insulated, and labeled 16 ohms. Okay, so I think now we're ready uh, to begin our audio demonstration. Well, the initial audio demo revealed three more problems with the circuit. Uh, number one, the 120 picofarad uh, capacitor, the lead was not connected to the bright switch, so the bright switch had no effect. Now it's soldered properly. Number two, all three of the capacitors in the oscillation loop were way out of spec, uh, 30 or 40 percent out, so I replaced all three of them with brand new uh, capacitors, uh, which uh, gave us back our tremolo effect at the proper strength. It did function before, but it was rather weak. And uh, last but not least, for some reason of all the controls, the only one that seemed dirty was the middle uh, tone control on the vibrato channel. It was real noisy. Now it's been cleaned. So now I think we're ready 
for the more formal audio demonstration and that will involve Ollie and Jack strumming some hopefully familiar tunes for you all.
Well, I guess that's about it for this rather lengthy video on the mighty 1965 uh, Fender Showman amp. Some viewers have uh, inquired why I'm not producing videos more often. Uh, and some of them even go so far as to ask if I'm dead yet. Uh, I'm not. I'm glad to report. But to be perfectly honest, um, this particular video took almost a month to complete between all of the repairs on the circuit itself, uh, ordering parts, waiting for parts, installing parts, shooting all of the video scenes, reshooting them, and all the editing, the audio demo and such, uh, it took a full 30 days. So please be patient with us. We're working at the fastest pace we can while still doing the best possible work. I hope you all feel it was worth the time and effort. Uh, I'd now like to take a few moments to uh, specifically thank all of my Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors for their generosity in supporting our channel and keeping us on the air. I uh, have seen that uh, YouTube is inserting commercials into my uh, videos. Uh, I want you to know that this is not with my uh, permission or approval and I do not receive a dime for any of these unwanted advertisements. Should you like to join these generous viewers in supporting our channel, I will put links in the video description to assist you in doing so. So that's the end of the show, no pun intended. Uh, and uh, it's farewell from Jack, Ollie, Casey, and Tennessee Tuxedo uh, from here in the great southwest. And it's time for us to start on our next amp and next video. So we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.